guest today is Mark Zandi, who runs Moody's Analytics and uh, founded its various predecessor entities before that. A very well-known macroeconomist and a very well-known what I'll call a real-time macroeconomist, which is to say that he focuses on actually bringing analytics to bear to current business and policy issues. He is relied on by people in both the public and private sector. He is one of the few genuinely bipartisan people I know in that he has worked on campaigns for or, or advised candidates on both sides of the political divide. Uh, and I think there's a whole host of reasons why he is looked at this way is he's a very much down the line kind of guy. And so uh, we need that kind of thing right now as we try to navigate this pandemic. So Mark, welcome. And thanks for being here. And I'm just going to start by opening up by asking, what are you seeing out there right now? And how has your thinking been evolving as we've been moving through this pandemic? Thank you, Richard. Thanks for the opportunity. I really appreciate it. And I, you know, obviously respect your work and your uh, center and uh, uh, very happy to be able to participate in the podcast with you. Uh, to answer your question, um, I think the good news is that we are now passing through the apex of the massive economic shock created by the crisis, the COVID crisis. And that shock is unprecedented. Uh, unemployment is going to peak in the month of May, somewhere north of uh, 20%. We're going to lose uh, 25 million or so jobs peak to trough. And that, of course, doesn't do justice to the financial suffering because you have a lot of people who've lost hours and had pay cuts. If you consider all those folks, we're talking at least 50 million workers. Uh, that's one third of the workforce that's been directly negatively impacted. This is off the charts in terms of the uh, impacts. But the good news is that we're turning the corner. Um, and I do think bet between now and Labor Day, conditions should improve. Uh, we'll get some job growth, unemployment will start to come in. Uh, and that's due to two factors. One, businesses are reopening. And I will say they are reopening uh, faster than I thought they would just a few weeks ago. That, that is a change in my thinking. Uh, now, of course, that raises the risk of uh, reintensification of the virus, a second wave. But barring that, uh, which is a bit big thing to consider and we should consider it, I, I do think we'll see uh, activity pick up pretty quickly here. Unemployment start to come in. My guess is by Labor Day, it'll settle in somewhere around 10%-ish. Just for context, that's going to feel a lot better than 20%, but just for context, 10% uh, was the peak unemployment rate we touched briefly in the financial crisis. So that gives you a sense of magnitude here. The other thing I'd say is that uh, on the other side of the business reopenings, on the other side of Labor Day, oh, I should mention, I did say there were two reasons. First is business reopens. The second is fiscal and monetary policy. You know, it's been very aggressive. The Fed's been so far successful in uh, creating a firewall between the economy, the mess in the economy, system, and that's been very helpful. And of course, lawmakers, Congress and the administration have passed uh, multiple rounds of fiscal rescue, and that's coming into the economy, supporting uh, people and businesses, and that, that's also going to help over the next few months. Now, on the other side of Labor Day, I do think the economy is going to uh, effectively flatline until we have a vaccine. And, you know, uh, unclear when that's going to be, but until then, I think the uncertainty uh, around the virus, its epidemiology. Are we going to have a second wave? How virulent? How disruptive? Are we going to get a vaccine? How effective? How quickly will it be adopted? All those things are going to weigh on the willingness and ability of businesses to expand their... Of course, it's going to make uh, consumers nervous as well. Uh, they're going to be more cautious. Also, there's going to be a lot of business failure between now and then. A lot of smaller... We have a lot of mid-sized companies that are going to fail because they levered up too much in the good times. And we're also going to have a lot of business failure, micro companies that are going to fail in the leisure, hospitality, restaurant, retail, travel industries, uh, transportation industries, manufacturing. And that, that means when, even when businesses reopen, a lot of businesses won't. So many people who think they're on furlough and get rehired just won't. They'll be on permanent layoff. And then the other thing I'll point out is, you know, historically, the economy's gotten a boost uh, because somewhere in the world, 
some economy navigated the recession, the previous, the, the typical recession and led the way out. China did that, for example, in the financial crisis. There's no, of course, no one's going to do that this go around. Uh, you know, everyone across the globe has been engulfed by this pandemic. And so it's no obvious engine of growth and, and, and that's going to be a problem. So yeah, I, I would be, be cautious. Uh, you know, things are going to feel better in the next two, three months. But again, on the other side of this, I think uh, we've got a lot of hard work to do. The economy's not going to recover quickly. It's going to take time. Uh, and we're really not going to kick into any kind of gear until we have a vaccine that is out there and people are using and confident with. So let's talk a little bit about the permanence of the job loss. Do you have any sense of how many of these temporary layoffs, in fact, will not be temporary? Um, how, how many people are really are going to have, I mean, this is disrupted, as you said, 50 million people's lives as it is, but you have a sense of how many are going to be disrupted for quite some time as a result of this? Yeah, I, I think that, I don't know. I, I mean, if you listen, if you, uh, one data point, encouraging data point, is that when the Bureau of Labor Statistics, the keeper of the, the employment data, uh, asked workers who lost their jobs whether they thought they were being furloughed, meaning they would get back to work with the same employer, or they were on permanent layoff. Three quarters or more said, I'm on furlough. You know, I'm not going to be permanently laid off. I'm going to go back to the employer that I just left. That is clearly on the high side of, of who's coming back. I mean, I, as I mentioned earlier, I think there's going to be a lot of businesses that do fail. So if you told me half of the workers who lost their jobs got back to work as businesses reopened over the next two to three months, I'd say that sounds about right to me. So that's how I get from a, you know, a 20% unemployment rate down to back, back down to a 10% unemployment rate. And then after that, I think there are sectors here of the industries that are more fundamentally disrupted and those jobs aren't coming back. You know, these people are going to have to get work elsewhere. Like one obvious example, brick and mortar retail, right? We, you know, this was a sector that was losing jobs, restructuring, transforming, even before the crisis, online re retailers were killing the brick and mortar guys and brick and mortar was losing jobs. But that wasn't a big deal because there were so many job openings, record open job positions. So people could move. I lost my job in retail. I can move somewhere else. Uh, but that's not going to be the case on the other side of that. So that's an obvious place. But leisure, hospitality, restaurants, you got to ask yourself, you know, will the restaurant industry come back in the way it was before? I mean, are people going to be eating out as much? And even when they can, will social distancing rules affect the way, you know, restaurants operate? Manufacturing, you know, global supply chains are been severely disruptive. I don't think they're going to be put back together the same way they were before the crisis just because we're pulling back from globalization, the process of globalization, uh, business is going to reevaluate just exactly how uh, extended they are globally. Uh, work from home, that's going to change things. So I think there's a lot of deeper, more fundamental structural changes that will result from the crisis that means that a lot of the people who are losing their jobs are going to have a very difficult time getting back to work. And if you, and again, if you told me, that it's going to take till the middle of this decade to get back to something assembling, resembling full employment, like an unemployment rate around four or five percent. Uh, that sounds about right to me. It's going to be a, it's going to be a long road. So, a number of things that you said I want to. So the the jobless claims number that came out today, the two point one million, did that surprise you, or was that sort of in your baked into? how you've been forecasting things. So when you talk about the apex, I mean, sort of, we would expect then new claims to be at zero. Right? Well, they don't go to zero, but you know, to be something yeah. more normal. Yeah, no, that was right to script. Uh, actually, interestingly enough, you can uh, get a good grip on UI claims. This is just a, a nerd factoid. If you look for Google searches for unemployment insurance or keywords that are similar and use that, you can come up with a very uh, accurate estimate of what UI claims are going to be during the week. So 2, 2 million, 2.1 million is what we got this week was right on the nose. You're right. We still have a high level of claims. So that means there's still a large number of people getting left. Although, that, although that's overstating the case uh, because uh, a lot of states are just late in processing claims for layoffs that occurred a week ago, two weeks ago, a month ago. They're just catching up. 
The other thing is that doesn't give you a window into hiring and hiring has picked up. So if you look at continuing claims, that is now actually, it actually declined last week. Uh, it's actually two weeks ago because it's one week lag. And so that's suggesting that you're getting a lot of layoffs, but you're now starting to need more hires and the number of you know, continuing claims are starting to decline. Uh, so I would expect, you know, in the next couple, three weeks, UI claims get down to two, 300,000 per week, which would be consistent with a, you know, no, fr- no significant amount of layoffs. We'll get more hiring and then we'll go from job loss to, to job gain. So in the June employment report, which, uh, you, know, is a, you know, the survey for that's gonna be done in a few weeks, that report will show positive job growth. Yeah, so I was gonna ask, so if we were to look at the decline in continuing claims and add it to the new claims, what kind of number is that right now? Do you have a sense of that? Uh, I, I don't know. I think continuing claims came in at, uh, I wanna say they came in at like 18 million. And so if you throw in the 2 million, that's probably at 20 million. Uh, but again, that's just that's new, that's not in considering the hirings that occurred during that week. So my, my guess is it's less than eighteen million. You know now, you know headed headed towards fifteen, probably closer to sixteen, seventeen million continuing claims, something like that. So a lot of what you were talking about feeds into real estate markets, which of course is what a lot of our audience is uh, interested in. Uh, so let's work through all of these. So we, I'm going to start with something interesting you said about the supply chain being disrupted. And does that imply more onshoring of stuff? And the, does that have the kind of positive implications for industrial real estate that uh, I would assume it would have? Yeah, I think it means some onshoring. Yeah, I think uh, supply chains got very extended prior to all this. Uh, you know, before the crisis. And I do think uh, even before the crisis, there was some reevaluation going on because I think businesses are getting nervous about the geopolitical environment, uh, which has been eroding since the financial crisis and uh, particularly with President Trump and the, the tariff war that he was pursuing. Just it's hard to, rem- uh, hard to believe that was, you know, not long ago, but a year ago we were engulfed in, you know, worries about the trade war. And so I think business people were growing very nervous about their extended supply chains and were starting to rethink them, bring them in, re, uh, move them around a bit. But this, this crisis is going to cause them to reevaluate, and I think it means they'll bring them in. So there will be some onshoring uh, of activity. Uh, I'm not sure, though, I think it directly translates into, oh, that's good for warehouse, industrial space, you know, particularly around... Uh, 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 ports, and ports and airports because there's other dynamics that suggest there's just going to be less trade. Uh, I think there's just going to be less international trade, at least for a while. I mean, because every country's put up the pr- proverbial border wall, uh, you know, at least figuratively. We're, we're doing it literally and figuratively, but figuratively. And it's going to be very difficult to get that wall back down uh, just because until certainly that's not happened until we have a vaccine that's widely distributed. But even after that, I think it's going to take some time. Uh, and, and, and then moreover, these supply chains are busted. They're broken. They're disrupted. To reconfigure them is going to take time. And so I think the next several years means just a lot less global trade. And that doesn't augur well for demand for space, warehouse, industrial space, around ports, seaports, other ports of entry, uh, it, you know, at least for a while. I think it's going to take a while. The other thing I'd, I'd, I'd say is I'm not particularly optimistic about the process of globalization either post-COVID. Uh, you know, I think uh, there's good, because people in all over the world, there's going to be a lot of unemployed people who are pretty upset and mad. Just judging by what happened after the financial crisis, that's going to translate into increased populism and nationalism, anti-immigration sentiment, anti-trade, anti-investment sentiment. So I think, you know, we are in store for a period of deglobalization that doesn't, again, doesn't argue well for, you know, global gateway cities or doesn't, you know, all else being equal or for um, industrial space sitting, sitting next to LA port or New York uh, Harbor. 
So despite these attitudes, do you think Americans are going to be willing to pay twice or three times as much for an undershirt as they're accustomed to paying? <laughs> right now, that's a serious question. <laughs> yeah, no, it's a great point. I mean, uh, they're going to have to pay more, uh, no doubt. I mean, you know, obviously that, that goes to the heart of the, the matter. I mean, globalization was a boon to the U.S. economy. Yeah, yeah there were winners and yeah, there were losers. Yeah, yeah the, the winners didn't take care of the losers and that's part of the problem here. But uh, the net benefit of globalization was slam dunk positive. And the, the best representation of that is what you just said. I could buy pretty much anything that I put on my body or anything I put in my mouth much more cheaply because of, of globalization. You know, the computer you're looking at, the cell phone I'm using, you know, the furniture that's sitting back, you know, in, in back of you, all of it, you know, is cheaper because of globalization. But we're going to, if we take a step back from it, then that means, yeah, we're going to be paying for more for it. Our standard of living is going to be lower and we're going to be diminished by it. No doubt about it. The other thing I wonder about is, you know, one of the things you're hearing is that corporations are going to keep more inventory going forward, which again would be good for warehouse space. Um, and I think people are very focused on the idea of resilience right now. And so if your supply chains are just too thin, it takes very little to disrupt them. Um, but how long are we going to keep that discipline? Because inventory is expensive. Quarterly earnings are going to be hurt by it. Uh, you avoid catastrophe by doing it, but it's like nobody likes buying insurance. Maybe that's the way I, I will put it. So do you have a set? Do you, do you think we will have learned this time around and we will see corporations keeping more inventory in place so that they can withstand disruptions or do you see two, three years down the line, we're back to where we were a couple of years ago? Yeah, good, good, great point. Way, I think it's a really good way of looking at it. It's insurance and, and yeah, for sure, they're gonna, all else being equal, hold more inventory relative to sales just because of what we went through. They, you know, every, this, scared, this is scaring the heebie-jeebies out of everybody. And that's what events do. Just like the, you know, the mortgage crisis, caused insurance premium, mortgage insurance premiums to go up, right? I mean, yeah. and, but I'll have to say in the mortgage insurance, I'm on the board of a, of a mortgage insurer, you know, premiums are all now 10 years after the financial crisis are all the way back in, right? And falling. So same dynamic here, because people are scared, they're going to build those inventory and then they'll start over time being more comfortable about the situation, presumably if nothing else goes wrong. And, you know, those inventories will come, come down. The other factor that drives inventories though, that I think may even play a bigger role uh, is just simply interest rates, right? Because if interest rates remain very low for a long time, your cost of financing is low. So I think a lot depends on what you think about the rate prospect for interest rates are going forward. Uh, that that may, be, may, may have a bigger, uh, play a bigger role in terms of how much inventory I hold relative to sale than, you know, the insurance premium that you're talking about. So, well, I don't see any reason why interest rates are going to go up anytime soon. So, that's a, that's a. <laughs> well, I'll tell you, the only thing I worry about is, you know, on the other side of the pandemic, you know, when uh, it feels like the coast is clear and we all come to realize two things. One, that our long run growth potential has been significantly diminished by this, that we're, we're not going to grow at 2% per annum. We're going to grow, and I'm not saying one, but they say one, eight, one, nine. And then we realize our debt loads globally are, you know, sovereign debt loads are globally are much higher than they were before all of this, that, you know, at that, at that juncture, we may see, uh, you know, interest rates rise you know, to more, to a greater degree than people anticipate. Kind of, sort of like European debt crisis after the financial crisis, you know, when we thought the coast was clearer and people said, oh my goodness, you know, we got a problem here. And in this case, it's a global problem because every country on the planet is using all of its fiscal resources to kind of try to navigate through as gracefully as possible this crisis. And so there's a lot of debt and de de uh, deficits and debt. So, you know, it's possible that the interest rate environment post COVID is very different than the interest rate environment post financial crisis. Well, the one, the, the, the encouraging thing though, is if you look at debt service and God knows what it's going to be after we yeah. towed up everything we're doing right now, but debt yeah. service to GDP and the U.S. is pretty low, and you know I think it's in Japan they're floating hundred-year bonds at basically zero percent yeah. interest. 
Uh, so, so long as we lock in at these low interest rates, I, I don't see how it, how there's going to be excessive pressure on that market. And of course, this is one of the big questions is how much debt can an economy take on and service it comfortably? You know, the U.S. economy, you know, um, if we look at net worth, it's like $105 trillion. And so if the federal government has... 20, 30 trillion of debt outstanding. Is that all right? And I don't know. You know the, yeah, the, no, no, it's a good point. Yeah. Uh, the metaphor I think about is, you know, whether a building has an LTV of 15, 25, or 35% doesn't matter. It's going to get the best financing available. Yeah. But when you move from, say, 65 to 75, right. then it starts to matter a lot. And so, you know, thinking about where these tipping points might happen. Yeah. Hard, hard to know. I, I guess the other question is, what what is our fiscal stance after all this? I mean, because you know, even before COVID, under current policy, the trajectory lines didn't look all that good if you bought into Congressional Budget Office, you know. So what does it mean on the other side of this, particularly if you buy into the idea that it's not two percent per annum, it's one point eight percent per annum, which yeah. sounds like a lot to people's ears, but when you you know, you do the arithmetic out ten of compounding, yeah. There you go. I mean, it's a big deal. So I, I just throw that out there. I don't, I, you know, I don't have strong views. I just wonder though, if we're, cause we've all, we're, we're all buying into the idea. Oh yeah. Rates are going to remain low for a long time. No, maybe, maybe that we should be at least examining that more carefully that, you know, that kind of working assumption that we all have. Okay. Let, let's move on to the next project. Let's talk about retail, um, which has been getting slaughtered the last three months, stores have been ordered closed, which means that they have no source of cash flow to pay rent. Although uh, my understanding is rent collections in May were pretty good, at, which suggests mm -hmm. that the PPP has actually done its job mm -hmm. pretty well. But as you noted, there are, uh, the trajectory of retail was not good before this crisis came along. So how do you see the shaking out over the next couple of three years. Uh, we do lead the world in retail space per capita. Uh, we have about 23 square feet, Canada is 16, Australia is 11, and then I think you go to the UK at like four and a half or something like that. How much shopping center space do you think is just gonna be converted to something else in the next couple of years? Yeah, I, I mean, I, 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 I don't, I'd like to hear the bull case for retail. I just can't <laughs> conjure it up, I, you know, I can't, I mean, this feels like it's existential for brick and mortar retail. Not that it's going to go all go away. I'm not, you know, that that's not. No, no. Yeah. But you know, it just feels like it's going to be a shadow of what it is. It's today. It's a shadow of what it was five years ago. And it's going to be, you know, even a smaller shadow five years from now. I just don't see how that gets reversed. The other thing that's happening here is that retail is going to become very concentrated. You're going to have some big winners and some big losers, right? I mean, Walmart, Target, Home Depot, Lowe's. I mean, these guys are just consolidating like mad. Costco. They're, Costco, they're booming. And they're just taking market share. The pie is getting smaller and the, and the share that's going to these big guys is rising and they're getting a bigger share of the pie. So that means for these mom retailers, I, you know, I don't know. I don't see how that works you know, for them. And then you, you brought up the point about the cost of goods. You know, if we're going to have to cost more to bring in imported product, you know, uh, I think uh, people are going to be looking for the best deal, much more cost price sensitive. And it's the big guys that can be able to, you know, they can use their, their, their market power and their pricing power to get, get the market share. So I think the, the thing that's going to happen here is that there's going to be a massive consolidation of the retail sector. And that, that means less, less space, uh, different kinds of space, but, but, but less space. Uh, and I just really don't see the bull case. I mean, and on the demand side of retail, I think consumers are gonna be, you know, there's gonna be some, there's gonna be a period where they're spending aggressively because there's a lot of pent up demand developing during all this. You know, if you're only buying 10 million cars, that's 10 on an annualized rate, that's 10 million below what you normally, so there's gonna be a pop here. But on the other side of that pent up demand pop, I think retail is gonna be struggling because, you know, half the population, lower income, uh, low middle income households are going to be struggling just with their, you know, living paycheck to paycheck if they have a paycheck. And the top half is going to be struggling with 
diminished wealth because of equity prices and everything else. So I, I just, I just can't see a way to argue that, you know, that it's going to be anything but um, uh, bleak for brick and mortar retailers. Yeah. And let me throw one other thing out there too, which is we have a lot of people entering their retirement years. And one thing we know is that when people retire, even if they're pensioners, uh, so that they have a decent income, they just spend less money because, you know, if you don't have to go to work, yeah, you don't have to dress up. You don't, there's just all kinds of yeah. stuff you don't need to buy anymore. What do you think work at work from home has implications for retail as well then? I, well, you know, I've been thinking about that because, uh, you know, I have a couple of beautiful suits hanging in my closet that I haven't even <laughs> looked at in about yeah, well, what, since yeah. March 10th or so. Right. And yeah, I may never need to buy a suit again. I don't think that many guys were buying suits anymore anyway. Um, you know, blue jeans. Unless last you stopped week. exercising, Richard. Did you, did you exercise? I do get exercise. Okay, yes. there you go. Actually, okay, I, I am in the best condition I've been in a long time. Oh, okay, right. perfect. You're good. Because you get so bored, right? You have to go do something. <laughs> uh, but one thing I have noticed, blue jeans last a really, really long time. Yeah, right. So, you know. <laughs> good point. So, uh, you know. I think, you know, you forget about that because when I was a kid, I'm, maybe for you too, I used to wear blue jeans all the time and then I stopped wearing them for some reason. But they're such a great, you know, apparel. That's they are great apparel. And, yeah. and unlike, like, khakis, yeah. They last forever. So, yeah, yeah I, I, I do wonder about the impact of this on the apparel sector. Uh, I, I, think the, I think one of the things, uh, though, that hasn't gotten enough attention to get this before COVID is just how older people don't buy stuff. Yeah. And the country is getting very old very quickly. Yeah. Yeah. The other, the other aspect of that, I think, is mobility, right? Because we know mobility has... Uh, sharply declined in recent years. And last year, I think it was the lowest on record. And that probably goes to the aging of the population as well. And COVID probably affects that too, at least for a while. I mean, people uh, kind of stuck in place for, for a little bit here. So, you know, that might have implications for, for, you know, obviously home sales, but also for a lot of consumption as well. Makes it more, makes it, puts a, puts a weight on it at least. So let's talk about, you know, the, the, so the property class that's most tied to employment, which is what uh, you started your remarks on is the office sector. And, and it seems to me that there are three things going on here. First of all, um, reading your stuff, one has reason to believe that employment in the office sector will recover more rapidly than other parts of the economy. So that's good for office. Um, office space is going to require more space per person than before as we socially distance. That's good. But again, if people really do work from home, if everyone from Twitter decides to stay home or Facebook, uh, that's less demand for office. So have you thought about how all of those factors are going to come together? Yeah, I, I'm also I'm bearish on the office space too. I mean, demand. I, I mean, I think you're right. If you have office space, you've got to have more per square foot because of the social distancing rules, at least for a while. Uh, yeah. But that to me means as an employer and I have, you know, I employ and I, people my after my payroll rents, my second largest expense, uh, that means I'm going to just allow more people to work at home. It's just an, ex it's costly. Uh, so I, you know, I'm not going to, uh, if I can, if I've got the technology and the ability, I'm not going to use as much space. And I really, now I'm speaking, sort of my experience here. Uh, the crisis has changed our dynamics in the office space dramatically, that the Zoom technology and similar technologies has really changed the dynamic. And most importantly, it's changed the dynamic for senior leadership of major corporations across the country. Because most senior, uh, the CEO, the CFO, the human resource head, they were, they're generally older, you know, like me, I'm a boomer. You know, they grew up in a time when you went to the office, everyone had to be there. That was key. You went home after work and uh, that was vital, that interaction. And there was a lot of resistance to work at home, even though that, had be, that was another trend that was starting, that was underway definitely before all this. But this event has changed the, behavior, the work behavior and work environment for those senior leaders, for the CEO, CFO, human resource head, 
and it's working very well for them. And uh, they can see the cost savings. And I think it's going to change dynamic, the dynamic here dramatically. So for major U.S. corporations in, the, in, in um, many industries, uh, uh, financial services, and of course, financial services is a huge consumer of office space, we're going to be consuming a lot less of it uh, uh, just because we can. And it's particularly effective. I mean, I was on a, I've been on Zoom calls all day. First call was with folks in Asia and I, you know, talking from folks in Tokyo, uh, Shanghai, Hong Kong, Singapore, Sydney, Kuala Lumpur, uh, all on the same call. And we all could see each other. And it was like, we were in the same room together. And so I'm asking myself why, and I'm, I'm talking to people that I would not normally talk to, you know, they're not as, they're less senior, they're further down on the totem pole. And I normally wouldn't even talk to them. I would, they would, I had no interaction with them, but now they're in the conversation. And that is, you know, from my perspective, you know, a fantastic thing. And then my dealings with clients, like, you know, my client, my relationship with clients is dramatically shifted and I don't need to be in an office. They under, they look at my background here and they're, ha- they're perfectly happy and they feel like we're closer. So, I think this is going to dramatically change the use of office space. And I'd be surprised if we don't see a lot less uh, space usage, you know, going forward. You know, you you hit a a really important point that hadn't occurred to me, which is about you interacting with the more junior people, because it, it occurred to me that one of the reasons that young people might want office space to remain a way that they work is it's a way to get the attention of bosses, like just showing up. They oh, accidentally, well, yeah. they, that's interesting. they accidentally yeah. see that you're there. And yeah. I, I think that is an important way to get ahead. Now, if you, they see you and they ask you a question and you say something stupid, then that's not going to help you at all. But, but the opportunity to interact with the more senior people, I think, is critical to young people's professional development. But mm-hmm. what you just said is something that didn't occur to me, is via Zoom – you are seeing young people that you otherwise wouldn't have seen. So mm-hmm. it's not clear which direction it goes in terms of the benefits to young people um, trying to uh, have their career move along. The other thing that occurs to me for young people is, of course, the workplace is a place to meet a potential yeah. spouse. Sure. Yeah. And I, uh, you know, so for those of us who've been married a long time, we don't need that yeah. interaction anymore. But, you know, yeah. for 20-somethings, what's going to substitute for that is not entirely clear to me because you can't go to yeah. bars either. Well, that's a good point. You make, you make a great point because we have an office in Prague. So Moody's policy is you don't, need to, you don't need to reopen an office if you don't want to. You know, the folks that are running that office make, make a decision. And even when they open the office, the employees can come or not come. It's up to them. But each office around the world is making their own decision with regard to whether they're going to open or not. So I have an office in Prague and the Prague office wants to open. And the reason is because they're young, you know, and also they're not, they're not from the Czech Republic. You know, they're from, you know, Poland, they're from Greece, they're from Russia and they don't, they don't, they don't have a family there. They don't know anyone there. So this is, this is their social life too. Right. So yeah. they want to get back together. So we're, we are opening the Prague office. Uh, now the Westchester office is saying, ah, no, don't worry about it. You know, we're, we're good. You know, so it depends, but I, that's a good point. I think, Young people are uh, uh, need that social interaction and want that social interaction. So um, I'm going to finish up by asking you about housing, but before we get there, I just and do you have any brief thoughts on hospitality? Well, I, you know, I'm, as you can tell, I'm pretty bearish on everything. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I think actually, here's the overarching point. I think CRE, commercial real estate, is in the crosshairs of this crisis. I mean, it, you know, there are a lot of trends in place. This, this supercharges all of them in the wrong, most, there's cross currents as you point out, but the net is, you know, for CRE. And hospitality, same deal. Again, I'm speaking my experience, but I can feel it all over, uh, you know, all, all my business interactions with people. Travel, we're just not traveling as much, not happening. You know, it's just not happening. You know, uh, it's expensive and it's not clear, it's, uh, particularly effective in, again, the Zooming technology and similar technologies allow you to interface with clients in a very effective way. And, I, you know, I, I just don't see it. Like, again, I go back to Moody's. I mean, it used to be the case that Moody's salespeople 
had a quota for uh, meetings. They had to get a certain number of meetings, face-to-face meetings, to hit one of their benchmarks for getting a bonus, right? That's gone. You know, there's nothing like that anymore. So I, I, I just don't see us going back, you know. And also there's a lot of legal issues, liability. You know, people don't want to travel partly, and, and there's a lot of legal liability issues as well that we're probably going to have to figure out and iron out here as we go forward. So if Moody says, oh, yeah, go travel, you have to travel, and someone gets sick, then – well, you know, what does that right. mean? So, well, I will tell you, every time I see some idiot on an airplane refuse to wear a mask because of, uh, quote, unquote, freedom, that's like another week that I don't want to get on an airplane. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. So, the, you know, I agree. Like, I, I have a briefcase sitting here. It's about it's 30 years old. My wife has been out, almost bought me a brand new one until the COVID crisis. And now I'm, that's it. I'm not getting the briefcase. I'm done. Oh, I, I, then let me recommend to you that, so, so my favorite um, comfort TV watching is reruns of Columbo. Oh, is that right? And there's one where his wife buys him a new raincoat. Oh, that's Oh, I, I had forgotten that one. Yeah, yeah so I check that one out. Okay. It, it probably, given your briefcase, you'll, you'll relate. So I'm learning it. a lot about you in your, in your COVID time. You're, you're exercising and you're watching Columbo. Yep, right? yep, <laughs> that's right. Um, and I'm reading Toni Morrison. So oh, you know, you a little, a little bit of improving my mind a little bit as well. That's right. Okay, let, let's finish up by talking about a topic you and I like to talk about a lot, which is housing. And, and let me just ask you to think about things in, in two dimensions and I'd be curious as to your thoughts. One is sort of multifamily versus single family. Are people going to want to be back in detached houses with backyards because of all of this? And the other is sort of cities in general. Does this put, and, and you referred to gateway cities losing some of their advantage already earlier. Uh, will the Seattle, San Francisco's, LA's, New York's, Boston's, Washington's not be the outliers relative to the rest of the country? that they were until three or four months ago. Yeah, I'll begin with uh, uh, the second uh, question first. Uh, I, I do think global gateway urban centers uh, will be diminished by this, that um, we will see, uh, and, and by the way, I, I think that was a dynamic that to some degree was already beginning for demographic reasons. I mean, one of the key demographic trends supporting urban centers was millennials in their 20s and early 30s and boomers in their 50s and, and 60s. You know, you had millennials wanting to be in the city and then empty nester boomers wanting to be in the city. That they're, Both those age groups are now aging to a place where that's no longer going to be the case. So the, 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 uh, the teeth of the boomer generation now is in their early 60s and the teeth of the millennial generation is now in their early 30s. So over the next five to 10 years, the, the millennials are going to get married. They're going to have a, they want to, they're going to want a family and they're going to own a home and it's more likely going to be in the suburbs than it's going to be in the, in the center city, particularly if they're working at home, you know, if they don't have to be in the city to get to a job. And then for the boomers, uh, they, you know, the, they're going to start getting in the late 60s, early 70s you know, living in the city is not going to be ideal given, you know, got lots of stairs generally, it's just not going to be as easy. So I think, you know, that's going to start changing it as well. So that dynamic was already on the cusp. We were only on the cusp of that dynamic already. And that's just going to, that was going to, that's going to play out anyway. But I do think all these other things we've been talking about, the uh, pullback and globalization, uh, you know, work from home, all these dynamics mean, uh, urban centers, and, and also perhaps just n- nervousness around things like the COVID crisis. Now, that, that may fade over time if there's no other pandemics or other concerns, but certainly over the next few years. So I think urban centers like New York, Boston, Chicago, Miami, Houston, you know, LA, San Francisco, Seattle, they're all going to be, uh, their star, they're still going to be fine, but on the margin, they're going to be uh, diminished by all by all of this. And I do think uh, we will see uh, significant demand for single family housing out in the suburbs for lower and mid price point homes, you know, homes that are, you know, more uh, competitive against, uh, you know, that, that aren't high, high priced, uh, but are affordable to folks in the lower and middle parts of the distribution, which are going to, you know, obviously they're, they're going to be, struggling a bit here on the other side of this, of this crisis for a while until we're back to full employment. 
So I, I think single family, low, mid price point housing should do just fine. I think there's a lot of reasons to be in the suburbs, you know, relatively optimistic about that. Uh, and, and then on the apartment side, you know, I, I don't have strong feelings one way or the other. I mean, except to say that the high end of the market came into this a bit overbuilt. And so there might be some bit of a shakeout there, you know, uh, during this period, but, uh, you know, I don't feel strong about it. So in terms of the home ownership rate, which is kind of encapsulates my thinking around single family versus rental, I don't see that changing to a significant degree. If anything, home ownership might continue to rise a little bit going forward, you know, given that dynamic, the dynamic around people, millennials going back into the suburbs, low interest rates, ample mortgage credit. And I think if you told me the home ownership rate was, you know, couple, three points higher five years from now, I'd say that sounds about right to me. I'm curious what you think. Is that sound, is that consistent with your thinking or is that, how would you, how would you, how would you answer that question? Uh, well, I'm supposed to be answering. I'm supposed to be asking yeah, I'm just Mark today. Because uh, this is the one I feel less strong about. I, I, not- I think that, uh, first of all, global cities have long been resilient and they move on to the next big thing. I mean, London's been the largest city in yeah. Europe for 800 years. Mm-hmm. New York's been the largest city in the United States since our birth as a country. Now that's a little bit, because Philadelphia was, Philadelphia was several cities initially. So if you would put them all together, uh, Philadelphia would have been a little bigger than New York in 1790. But I, I do think that these cities, I mean, you know, Tokyo got completely destroyed at, during World War II, and now Tokyo is the only place that's growing in all of Japan. So I, I guess I would never short mm-hmm. a world-class city um, mm-hmm. long run. So mm-hmm. 10 years from now, I think New York's going to be New York, and San Francisco's going to be San Francisco. I mean, there'll be different places, but they will have mm-hmm. their places in the pecking order that they do now. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, f- the next five years, I think, are going to be very tough for New York City, mm-hmm. specifically because the, it got mm-hmm. hit so hard by the crisis. Um, and I think it's controversial how much transit contributes to the spread. Um, but mm-hmm. whether it, the scientists think it's a controversy, people are going to think it did. Mm-hmm. People are going to be afraid to get on the subway. And you think about New York's operations as a city, it, it can't survive without mm-hmm. people taking transit. Uh, and so mm-hmm. fear, I think, will hold back New York for some years, but only for some years. Not, I, my guess is mm-hmm. we look 10 years from now, unless, again, there's another pandemic, Mm-hmm. Uh, New York will continue to be a place that young people want to go and learn and when they're 35, be tired of it, move somewhere else. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think one of the things, my, my colleague Jorge de la Roca has a wonderful paper on this about how much learning happens in great cities. Mm-hmm. By that, I don't mean school learning. I mean people who go to work in, in Hong Kong, in Tokyo, mm-hmm. in London, in... New York, in San Francisco, if you watch people who spent time in those places and then decide, I want to live in Kansas City, mm-hmm. they'd be better in Kansas City than the people who never went to those cities. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah, so uh, hmm. I, I think I agree with you short run. Mm-hmm. Uh, long run, I'm not so sure. Right. Um, single family, multifamily, I think – yeah, other than the coasts, you're absolutely right. Why? I mean, again, I, I am grateful that when I am stuck at home, I do have a backyard. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think that's going to mm-hmm. be really appealing to people for a while. Of course, coastal mm-hmm. city still, it's so damn expensive mm-hmm. to buy a single family house. I, I don't know if there's going to be the opportunity. Um, apartments, what, what I think about is when I talk to some of our board members is garden apartments where you don't have an elevator, they're going to do great. Mm -hmm. Iris apartments. Not so sure. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So anyway, uh, Mark's Andy Moody's analytics. Thank you so much. It's always a pleasure to talk to you. Uh, Thank you, Richard. And uh, great having you on Lust perspectives. Uh, Hope we can do it again sometime. 
Yeah, I hope I'm half right. That's what I'm shooting for. So. No, uh, you'll do better than that. <laughs> okay, thank you. Thank All you. right. All Thanks right. so much.